On May 27, 1883, the newly crowned Alexander III led a grand procession from the Kremlin to the Cathedral of Christ the Savior on horseback. The imperial family followed behind in a carriage. As they arrived, a new musical composition by Peter Tchaikovsky provided the perfect accompaniment. Tchaikovsky was an acclaimed composer by this time. With an international reputation and a deep sense of patriotic pride, he was the perfect choice for the occasion. And his composition, the 1812 Overture, didn't disappoint. It was a splendid musical recreation of the battle with Napoleon, a triumphant, patriotic ode whose power arouses great emotion. It captures the direness of the French threat as conveyed by the sound of snare drums and the Marseille, which are extinguished as the piece progresses. And the piece incorporates the bells and hymnal sounds associated with the Russian Orthodox Church and melodic strains from Russian folk music, as well as both the French and Russian national anthems. Ultimately, it conveys the glory of the Russian victory, including the blare of Russian cannons and the chiming of Russian church bells. It serves to remind us of a Russia epitomized by its church, its czar, and its people. Just a century earlier, elite Russian culture had been characterized by European imitation and importation. But by the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, Russian artists were taking great pride in their own national achievements. And Russian art and culture were on their way to being considered among the most exceptional in the world. The reign of Alexander III, 1881 to 1894, and the new czar's policy of Russification inevitably promoted native Russian culture. It also provided the framework for a period of tremendous cultural and aesthetic vitality in Russia. Russia began to industrialize with vigor during the 1880s and 1890s at the supremely capable hands of finance minister Sergei Vita. After decades of stagnancy, foreign loans and state-sponsored building initiatives like the famous Trans-Siberian Railroad now helped Russia's economy to soar and the country's industrial growth rate exceeded 7% a year through the end of the century. The government was thrilled. So it essentially gave the men who owned and ran the factories and industrial complexes carte blanche. However, without any credible regulations or oversight, the industrial working class was underpaid and generally exploited. So when industrialization finally came to Russia, it generated enormous wealth while also inspiring an increasingly active workers' movement and a new generation of revolutionaries. But within this group of rising new capitalists, we also find committed art patrons. Together with the government, these Russian industrialists financed a flourishing of arts and culture during the final decades of the Romanov Tsars. The wealthy merchant and art lover, Pavel Tretikov, led an impressive number of the growing wealthy industrial class in becoming patrons of the arts. And as a cohort, these men and women helped to stimulate what has been called Russia's Silver Age. Tretikov commissioned portraits of Russia's great writers, painters, and composers. These paintings grasped Russia's distinctive national character and presented the country's history, art, and science as reflected in the lives of the people. After the death of his younger brother, Sergei, who was also an art lover and collector, Tretyakov went on to donate most of the men's amazing collections to the city of Moscow in 1892. And six years later, when Pavel Tretyakov passed away, in accordance with the terms in the collector turned donator's will, the Tretyakov Gallery opened in the family's renovated home in Moscow. Another of Russia's wealthy art patrons was Sava Mamontov, who lived from 1841 to 1918, an industrialist whose family made a fortune by investing in the country's expanding network of railroads. Mamontov hosted artists in his Moscow home, and his interests led him to establish an artist retreat at the Abramstva estate outside of Moscow, near the Holy Trinity Monastery. Mamontov and his wife, Elizaveta, 
shared the anxieties of many devotees of the international arts and craft movement of the late 19th century. Seeing the way that industrialization had diminished individual creativity, the proponents of the movement sought to promote an appreciation of pre-capitalist forms of culture. At Abramsova, the Mamatovs set up workshops to revive traditional peasant crafts, and they encouraged Russian artists to incorporate old Russian culture into their art. The Abramsova workshops came to enjoy great prestige among Russia's artistic community. Many of the country's most prominent artists, including artists Ilya Repin, Valentin Sarov, the Vaznetsov brothers, and Mikhail Vrubel, worked and found inspiration at Abramsova. Ilya Repin captured the beauty and tranquility of the colony with his 1880 painting, Abramsova. Repin's friend, Valentin Sarov, also found emotional solace and artistic inspiration there. Sarov's 1887 portrait, Girl with Peaches, captures the Mamontov's daughter at the estate's dining room table. It's considered one of Russia's greatest examples of Impressionism. The art historian Rosalind Blakesley says, the work provides a masterclass in painting texture and light and distinguishes itself with its radiant color and artless brushstroke. Given the Mamatov's focus on Russian peasant crafts, the artists at Abramsova didn't confine themselves only to canvas. Mamatov himself started producing and directing plays and operas, and many of the Abramsova artists supported the initiative by designing sets and costumes. This was an unprecedented theatrical innovation in a theatrical culture still dominated by the ossified traditions of the state-run imperial theaters. Mamontov ultimately lost his fortune after he was falsely accused of embezzlement at the turn of the century, but not before he and his fellow art patron, the Princess Maria Tyshnisnova, sponsored a new magazine called Mir Uskustva, The World of Art, and it was run by an innovative art critic named Sergei Diaghilev and his collaborator, Alexandre Benoit. Diaghilev and Benoit, who was a theater director, painter, and librettist, used their journal to inject further vigor into the Russian art scene. Everyday items like icons, toys, and the cheap hand-colored prints known as lupki came to be celebrated for their artistic val value. And new artists increasingly applied their talents to produce jewelry, pottery, embroidery, furniture, and interiors. In literature, during the fin de siècle period, the soul-searching novels of Russian literary giants Dostoevsky and Tolstoy gave way to short stories and plays, and to the cheeky apathy and desperate disillusionment of Anton Chekhov's works, such as The Seagull from 1896, Uncle Vanya from 1899, Three Sisters in 1901, and The Cherry Orchard from 1903. There aren't clear-cut heroes or villains in Chekhov's literature. Instead, his characters seem recognizable, often unexceptional, and relatable. The playwright presents the tedium that invariably confronts all of us at times, as well as the counterproductive longings that can distract us. Unfaithful spouses, gambling debts, and marriages forged out of tempered consideration rather than passionate love. Chekhov's characters and plots also remind us of how human beings can easily complicate their own lives, often unnecessarily. Chekhov's first play to make a splash, The Seagull, is set on a lakeside estate populated by a small group of artists who are entangled by family and romantic connections. It's the antithesis of the pastoral tranquility found at the Mamatov's Abramsova colony. Chekhov presents actors and writers, even those related by blood, engaged in creative competition rather than collegiality. Two male writers compete for artistic legitimacy, as well as the affections of the actresses in their lives. Chekhov wrestles with the tension between art for art's sake and art produced for social purpose or material gain. Alert audiences are prompted to question the price people pay in order to reap financial rewards or social accolades. 
Behind it all are questions related to the meaning of life and the purpose of each individual. Yet if an audience is looking for answers from Chekhov, it will be disappointed. The seagull, like many of his works, closes and the curtain lowers with no satisfying resolution at hand. Chekhov, like the characters in The Seagull, would remain insecure about his art. Trained as a physician, he continued to treat patients at his country home. And even after his plays had achieved great acclaim, he told a friend just before he died in 1904 that he hoped his plays might resonate for another seven years or so. Yet more than a century after his death, the enduring popularity of Chekhov's plays attests to their literary value and universal appeal. Chekhov's literary creations and the new Moscow Art Theater, founded in 1898 by the actor and textile industrialist Konstantin Slanislavsky and the playwright Vladimir Nemirovich Danchenko, created an innovative, dramatic experience that heightened the prestige of the theater and its artists alike. Stanislavski and Nemirovich Danchenko encouraged risk-taking and innovation in ways that would have been anathema in the more conservative and established imperial theaters funded by the state. Indeed, Stanislavski developed the practice of method acting, that is, emotionally expressive performances based on personal identification with the part. And method acting wound up revolutionizing the field of drama. In the Moscow Art Theater's renovated Art Nouveau space, directors found the opportunity to stage productions with creative lighting and technological innovations, including a revolving stage. Techniques as simple as dimming the theater lights so that audiences would focus on the actors rather than on each other helped to elevate drama to a high art form. The theater's decor was also simple and austere to mitigate distractions. Set designers focused on realistic accessories and backdrops, and close attention was paid to what characters from a particular era, region, or class would have worn. The results delighted audiences. In recognition of the role that its staging of Chekhov's The Seagull played in the subsequent success of the Moscow Art Theater, the theater adopted a seagull as its emblem. Another theater, just a short walk away, already enjoyed a long history and storied tradition. Established by Catherine the Great a century earlier, the Bolshoi Theater was a grand building with a six-tier auditorium that could accommodate more than 2,000 people. The boxes closest to the stage were reserved for the imperial family. The building was designed to impress. The theater had evolved over the years the latest incarnation opened in 1856, just in time for the coronation festivities of Alexander II. The architect, Alberto Cavos, had crafted different stucco arabesques for each floor. He draped the theater's boxes in bright crimson, and he'd erected an enormous chandelier with more than 300 oil lamps. Impressive to look at, the Bolshoi Theater also featured some of the best acoustics in the world, this was important because its specialty was opera, European and Russian. Some of the more important works that the Bolshoi staged during the 19th century included Mikhail Glinka's A Life for the Tsar and Ruslan and Ludmila, Moras Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov, Alexander Borodin's Prince Igor, and Peter Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin and Queen of Spades. The Bolshoi theater also hosted ballets Although in the 19th century, the Bolshoi's ballet took a back seat to the St. Petersburg Marinsky Theater and Ballet School. An auspicious combination of timing and circumstances powered the Marinsky Ballet's meteoric rise during the latter part of the 19th century. With the Tsar state providing annual subsidies of 2 million gold rubles, the Imperial Ballet at the Marinsky enjoyed financial resources unlike any other ballet company in the world. And the extraordinary ballet master and choreographer, Maurice Petipa, served as the Marinsky Theater and School's principal master from 1862 until 1903. Petipa revolutionized the art form. 
He turned ballet into a multi-act production with a plot combining fully developed scenes of classical ensembles, colorful character dances, genre spectacle, scenes, and pantomime. And perhaps most extraordinary were the brilliant assortment of St. Petersburg artists whom Petipas found to serve as collaborators. Among these was Tchaikovsky, who loved the ballet and wrote music that was essential to its production, rather than serving as mere accompaniment, as had been customary in the past. Tchaikovsky's first ballet, Swan Lake, was produced in 1876. Although based on a German fairy tale, it is, in many ways, a quintessentially Russian work. In Russian folklore, the swan signifies faithfulness and love. Suzanne Massey, an interpreter of Russian culture, says, the image of white swans shedding their wings at night to become maidens recurs in many tales. And so it is with Swan Lake's Odette, a princess who after being put under an evil sorcerer's spell, reverts to her human state under the cover of darkness. One of the protagonists, Prince Siegfried, encounters Odette by chance as she changes from a swan in flight to her human form. Siegfried is completely enchanted. Furthermore, because he needs to marry in order to become king, and a debt can be freed from the spell by true love only, it seems as if the ballet's principles are destined for a happy ending. But another spell maliciously complicates the march towards freedom and intervenes in the would-be lover's plans. Odette and Siegfried ultimately find each other and true love only in the hereafter, as death breaks the sorcerer's spell. Tchaikovsky followed this work with breathtaking scores for the ballet Sleeping Beauty in 1889 and The Nutcracker in 1892. Still, it's Swan Lake, in my view, that conveys the beauty, tragedy, and grace of the Russian ballet more than any other. Though I must admit that I do have a personal bias. Swan Lake was the first ballet that I ever saw performed in Russia, and so it remains an almost magical memory. I suspect that many of you might have similar experiences. The first audiences to see Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake performed at the Bolshoi Theater in the 1870s didn't share this positive impression. The ballet became a sensation only after the choreography and score were revised by the French-born dancer and choreographer Maurice Petitpas and his collaborators during the 1890s. Swan Lake's transformation demonstrates how pivotal every element of a ballet is to its overall success. Even Tchaikovsky's beautiful score wasn't sufficient on its own to earn the ballet much in the way of accolades. Before continuing this discussion of the ballet, allow me to make a couple of additional points about Peter Tchaikovsky. As we saw at the opening of this lecture, Tchaikovsky powerfully employed his music to convey a story, as in the 1812 Overture. The stories he, he told reflected his attachment both to Russian nationalism with its strong autocracy, powerful church music, and evocative folk tales, and European classicism. Tchaikovsky's ability to blend these influences allowed him to become one of Russia's first international cultural stars. Tchaikovsky was the first Russian composer to become widely known and admired abroad. A few years before he died, he conducted at the 1891 opening of Carnegie Hall amid a world tour. Tchaikovsky was able to devote himself to composing thanks to the generous patronage of the wealthy widow Nadezhda von Meck. The year after the 1812 overture debuted, Tsar Alexander III began contributing an annual pension to Tchaikovsky's support as well. These funds helped him become a prolific composer of symphonies, concertos, ballets, and operas. Tchaikovsky died in St. Petersburg in 1893 from what appeared to be cholera. In spite of the reverence he'd enjoyed and the contributions he'd made to Russian and world culture, Tchaikovsky was a broken man at the time of his passing. 
He'd struggled for years with the psychological turmoil of living as a closeted gay man. The passion and emotion we experience in his compositions no doubt emanates from the personal struggles he faced. While the Russian ballet benefited enormously from Tchaikovsky's genius, there were many other contributors too, including the immensely talented dancer Matilda Kashinskaya, who conducted a protracted love affair with the future Nicholas II before his marriage to the Empress Alexandra. Other notable Russian dancers included the prima ballerina Anna Pavlova and Vaslav Nijinsky, who's considered to be the greatest male dancer of the early 20th century. Russian ballet also benefited from that great promoter of the arts, Sergei Diaghilev. After the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905 broke out, funding for Diaghilev's magazine, World of Art, was drying up, and its editor found himself at a crossroads. Having focused on a Russian public for more than a decade, he now resolved to bring his vision to the Western public. Originally, Diaghilev didn't express much interest in ballet. He first organized an exhibition of Russian painting in Paris. To add to its allure, he enlisted Russian musicians and singers to perform alongside it. Following on this, Diaghilev arranged for a series of Russian concerts in 1907. The Russian opera singer Fyodor Chulyapin, with his expressive bass voice, performed a masterful rendition of Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov and took Paris by storm. The pianist Sergei Rachmaninoff also revived his career there, while the composer Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov demonstrated that Russian conductors were as accomplished as any others. Diaghilev, with encouragement from his friend and magazine partner, Alexandre Benoit, now turns his attention to ballet. Ballet, in the words of the historian Bruce Lincoln, allowed Diaghilev to blend kaleidoscopic combinations of sight, sound, and motion into musical pictures that left the stunned audiences of Paris breathless. Like Sava Mamontov at Abramsova, Diaghilev brought together an impressive collection of Russian artists who worked in a variety of media, and they produced a uniquely spectacular, holistic vision. Diaghilev enlisted supremely talented painters like Benoit, Leon Box, Natalia Gocharova, Mikhail Larionov, and Alexander Golovin to design sets. Musicians, so, such as Igor Stravinsky and Sergei Prokofiev composed scores, and dancers and choreographers like Vaslav Nijinsky, Michel Fokin, and Anna Pavlova brought his vision to life. This venture became known as the Ballet Russe, and the collection of talent that Diaghilev drew to it was staggering. Over time, Diaghilev expanded the collaborators to include non-Russian creators, as well, including the Spanish painter Pablo Picasso, the Italian writer Giorgio de Chirico, and the French composer and pianist Francis Poulenc. By 1911, the Ballet Russe were, was performing extended engagements in London and had a permanent home in Paris. Its ballets and operas, rooted in Russia's cultural history, allowed artists to communicate their interpretations of Russian folk art and folk tales to non-Russian audiences. And audiences entered into a delightful, exotic world that seemed far removed from the metropolises of London and Paris. Yet, like many artists of his generation, Diaghilev was plagued by anxieties aroused by the industrial world. And he sought solace in his imagined understanding of native Russian culture. The set designs and dance costumes from Borodin's opera Prince Igor and the image of the magical firebird in Igor Stravinsky's 1910 ballet The Firebird are two examples of how Parisian audiences developed an understanding of Russia rooted in its seeming foreignness and exoticism. Indeed, Diaghilev advanced Stravinsky's career by commissioning him to write the score for The Firebird when Stravinsky was still unknown. In turn, Stravinsky proved himself able to use Russian folklore as stylistic inspiration. 
Audiences and critics alike loved the work and Stravinsky's score. The composer had similar success with the ballet burlesque Petrushka in 1911. But the streak came to an end with Rite of Spring in 1913. Audiences weren't quite ready for the frenetic, unorthodox nature of either the score or choreography. Perhaps inspired by the upheaval of 1905 and the ensuing political tension and violence in Russia, a new generation of Russian artists now rebelled against old standards and forms. In the visual arts, this comes across in the transition from Impressionism to Modernism. Works by the French painters Paul Cézanne, Paul Gauguin, and Henri Matisse challenged Russian artists to, artists to rethink their previous assumptions. Russians also began to meld trends from post-Impressionism, Cubism, and Futurism in their revivals of peasant and abstract art. Gauguin's work exerted a particular influence on Russian painters. He was part of a movement known as Primitivism, whose adherents eschewed Western industrialization for pre-industrial, non-Western cultures. Russian artists embraced Gauguin's ideas. But instead of traveling to Tahiti for inspiration, as Gauguin had done, the Russians focused on Russian folk culture. The avant-garde Russian painter Natalia Goncharova collected peasant dolls and toys and studied peasant woodcuts and embroidery. And her work employed bold colors and stark lines. This new group of modern artists aroused resentment among the established creative community in Russia, as often seems to be the case. Facing resistance, some of the young painters organized the Jack of Diamonds exhibit in Moscow in 1910. More than 20 artists took part, including Goncharova, the futurist David Borliak, the avant-garde painter Mikhail Larionov, and theorist and abstract artist Vasily Kandinsky, and the modernist Marc Chagall. The era of modern art in Russia was underway. A new cadre of radical writers was also coming to the fore to highlight the failings of the Russian government and elites. One of these was the writer Maxim Gorky, whose first collection of stories, published in the last years of the 19th century, presented the struggles of Russia's oppressed working class. His play, The Lower Depths, performed at the Moscow Art Theater in 1902, depicts the misery and the hopelessness of Russia's poor. This work earned Gorky radical fans as well as official opprobrium. He was arrested several times and after 1905 spent almost a decade living in European exile. Throughout this lecture, we've seen the importance that non-state actors had in the development of the arts during Russia's Silver Age. I'd now like to turn back to the Imperial Palace temporarily to consider a unique example of craftsmanship that would be hard to imagine without the support of the Russian emperor and the imperial family. I'm talking about the jewelry and decorative arts produced by the House of Fabergé. Fabergé family, originally from France, settled in St. Petersburg during the 19th century. Family patriarch Gustave Fabergé trained as a goldsmith, but it was his son, Peter Carl Fabergé, born in the 1840s, who would earn the family international acclaim. Alexander III commissioned a custom jeweled Easter egg for his wife after seeing some of Fabergé's work at an exhibit in the 1880s. Easter eggs were an important part of Russian tradition. They symbolized rebirth and new life, and they aligned perfectly with the resurrection theme of Easter. The first imperial Easter egg that Fabergé designed in 1885 appeared rather simple from the outside. But once open, the white shell was transformed into a literal golden egg. Gently cradled within was a golden hen with ruby eyes. The Empress, Maria Fedorovna, was delighted with her husband's gift, and so began an annual tradition. Fabergé eggs were opulent, imaginative, and decorative treasures whose only purpose was to delight the imperial family. The one directive the emperor gave to the Fabergé jewelers was that each egg needed to be unique and must contain a surprise. 
After Alexander died in 1894, his son Nicholas II continued this Easter tradition, and he commissioned two eggs a year, one for his mother and one for his wife Alexandra. Over time, the Fabergé eggs became increasingly connected to the personalities and history of the imperial family. One of the most iconic among them is the coronation egg of 1897. Its golden shell is accented by double-headed eagles, the emblem of the House of Romanov, and set with diamonds. Inside is a gold and diamond replica of a coronation carriage so detailed that it took jewelers more than a year to complete. Fabergé exhibited a collection of the imperial eggs at the 1900 World Exhibition in Paris, where they delighted the jury and the spectators. His fame spread, and he received commissions from kings, queens, aristocrats, and wealthy industrialists around the world. But the jeweler's primary client remained the Russian royal family. If we look at the Fabergé imperial Easter eggs without any historical context, it may be easy to become enthralled by their opulence and craftsmanship. But the Fabergé eggs also represented a ruler completely isolated from his people. While Russian workers broadly suffered economic exploitation and political repression, Fabergé's jewelers spent months setting diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, all to give the empress an opulent surprise. <laughs>